Okay. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter Hiller. Thank you. And thank you to Summerlee and everybody else at the Cartoon Art Museum. I was really um, motivated to have an exhibit here because I knew that there was material in the Joe Moore archive that the public had never seen before. Uh, there was three sets of drawings that were cartoons, and I could not think of a better place this side of the Mississippi um, to exhibit those cartoons better than, no place better than the Cartoon Art Museum. So this is a dream come true for me, so I'm, I'm just thrilled. The only place east of the Mississippi is Ohio State University, and they have the biggest cartoon collection that I know of, but they really just like to show the cartoonists in their collection. So Summerlee and everybody here was open to um, bigger ideas, so I appreciate Thanks. that. And um, I know Julie's here. Julie was one of the curators, along with Andrew, and so thank you very much for what you did. Um, so it's, a, it's been a, a great project. Now, having said that, um, let me give you a little sense of what I'm going to do tonight. And what I'm not going to do initially is talk about the exhibit. Um, and there's two reasons to that. One is because you have great text panels to read that correspond to the material in the exhibit. And also, I'm happy to answer questions about the material in the exhibit. But what I wanted to do is give you a, a, a look at Joe <coughs> other than the material that's in the exhibit. And as wide for um, reaching as that is, and has much variety to it that there is, there's a lot more to his story than um, than any one exhibit can hold. So I'm going to talk, give you a sense of who he was as an artist, and then um, we're going to talk about his work in the general Bay Area, um, just to sort of give you the part of the bigger picture for him. If that, I'm hoping that sounds okay. If it doesn't, then we'll we'll talk about charades or something like that. <laughs> uh, I I recently read a book about octopuses. And I was absolutely fascinated with how intelligent they are, to the point that they can think in each of their eight legs and be thinking eight different things simultaneously through each of their tentacles. And I got to thinking about that, and I thought, well, you know what, it's a weird analogy, but that's kind of the way Joe Mora is. And so what I did, and and... As I was thinking about this, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, there's got to be a drawing of an octopus that Joe Moore created somewhere. And I had, didn't know, I hadn't, that hadn't been something I'd ever noticed before, but I started looking back through all of his material, including uh, books he illustrated when he was um, a young budding artist, and sure enough, I found a drawing that he had done of an octopus. So in fact, that octopus sort of became a symbol for me for um, what Joe does. And it is everything from being a painter, a cartoonist, a sculptor, a printmaker, photographer, cartographer, an author, an illustrator. And in fact, he's enough. He does so many things, he could fill two octopuses. <laughs> so there's another, the cowboy. He's a muralist, the diorama crafter, um, on and on. And I'm going to show you examples of this work. But I, it just seemed it ended up being sort of a fitting analogy um, to describe him and how multifaceted his work in life was. So we have an example of him as a painter. And this is a classic oil on canvas. He didn't do very much of this as far, in fact, it's probably his least recognized work is, is actual painting and painting oil on canvas. The curious thing is that that's what most artists are identified as, as painters. Um, lots of them as sculptors, perhaps, but that's kind of the single most um, obvious idea for an artist. And because Joe did so little of that, may go to the question of why he is not better known than he is. So that's something to sort of contemplate. But when he did paint, he was very accomplished, and he did a very good job. 
Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. He painted in oil, um, in oils, as we just saw. This is a watercolor. He used watercolors a lot. So th there's, there's even an interesting difference. Um, not very many oil paintings, but lots of watercolors and gouaches um, throughout his career. He was an illustrator. This is um, part of the civ uh, civilians training um, program that he illustrated their yearbooks. And this is one example of that, probably the early 1920s. He was a writer. This is a, one of his two, it was sort of two companion books. Uh, Trail Dust and Saddle Leather was about the American cowboy. The book he wrote after that is called Californios, and it was about the Becceros of California. And so he wrote, he illustrated it as well as writing the whole text. And he did this in the 40s, 1940s, and these books still um, hold their weight today. They're still used as references uh, for people wishing to learn about the American cowboy and their gear and um, their life, their style, um, and everything. He was a printmaker. This is a set of etchings that I ended up putting together um, based on, and there's a photograph up at the top there that shows, these are Joe's plates, his copper plates, and so we use those plates to make a, a set of the etchings because the prints themselves um, were virtually non-existent um, from his day when he did the etchings. So printmaker, um, I actually brought some of these tonight that are available for sale and half the proceeds go to the Cartoon Art Museum. He was a cartographer. This is one of the last pieces that he did is, this is his Ode to Los Angeles, uh, and probably my favorite uh, of his maps. These are called pictorial maps, and they're, they're a style of map making. Joe was not the only one who worked in that style, but he developed a very clear style to his work. So you can, if you looked at six different pictorial maps, and two of them were Joe's, you could probably pretty quickly you know, identify the two that were his. He had a style that he brought to it, um, and other map makers' styles vary. But what's wonderful about these is they're historically very accurate, and yet they're done in a very playful, lighthearted manner. And I, I liken them to reading a book before you go to bed, and every time you look at this, you read something else. There's just so much information packed into these. Uh, and again, uh, most of it is historically accurate, um, and they're just real entertaining pieces. We have several of them here in the exhibit. He was a hippie before there were hippies. Uh, so, and this is uh, this is an illustration from a children's book that he wrote called Budgie Budgie Cottontail. It was used fairly recently by the Monterey County Fair, 2017, as their visual. It was the fourth time that I've had the opportunity to have Joe's artwork used for their publicity um, posters for the year. And this is an image that for years my wife kept telling me every time we'd have occasion to give the book as a baby present or something. She goes, you know, that one has really got a real hippie component to it. So, well, of course, so for the Summer of Love, what better image uh, um, than that one for Joe? And it's very different than the rest of the illustrations in the book. He was a photographer. So this is an example of a picture he took while he was living with the Hopi in 1904, 05, and 06. And we'll talk more about that. He was a cowboy. So here he is in his, at that same period in his life, he was about uh, 27 or so when this picture was taken. He, and we'll talk more about this time, but those chaps were his. He wore them out, he softened them up, he used them himself, he used them then as models when he would do sculptures, um, and they're still actually um, available. We know where they are. 
He was a diorama maker. This is the part of a segment of the Portola expedition, which was in the 1939 World's Fair on Treasure Island here in San Francisco. It was in the California building. It was 100 feet long, so I suspect pretty close from one wall to one wall here. And the lighting changed uh, as you walked along. It went from dusk to dawn, and there were over 100 um, figures, including horses and mules. Um, the sad thing is that the, virtually the last day of the fair, the building caught on fire, and the entire diorama was destroyed. Um, and it was it, it was just too big a project to recreate it. So all we have are some vintage photographs of it. It's a picture of Joe in his studio, which at this time was in Pebble Beach, and working with several artisans on the diorama, and you can see the different stages of the pieces, and uh, you know, here, here's some of the horses in the background that are out on the hillside, over here are some that have been painted um, in this is area. Um, he is right there, yep, and so the, the, this, the scope of this project was so big that he couldn't do it by himself. So he hired people that he knew and trusted, and, and they helped out, two of whom I had the pleasure of meeting and interviewing, uh, which was a real thrill for me. Uh, this is another part of, of a diorama, and I want to show you sort of the sequence of how this came about. So this, this is smaller, much smaller. It's kind of, you know, fruit label box or fruit box size. And he did about 14 of these for Will Rogers. And they are now in Oklahoma at the Will Rogers Memorial. And each one was a segment in Will Rogers' life. This being his home in the Pacific Palisades where he had a ranch and is still there to this day. This room still looks virtually the same as it did in this photo, which was probably taken in the 40s. Uh, and so he would have initially had this photo to look at, he then did a watercolor, you know, to sort of pitch the idea of what the diorama <laughs> could look like. And then this is the actual diorama before it's set into um, a case. So you can see the lumber here that's actually hidden now by the display case. Um, but you get a sense of how he went, you know, step by step in creating this. Another example, of this is another one of the Will Rogers dioramas. It gives you a sense of the scale, having Joe standing there, uh, so you get a sense of how big they were. He was a muralist. This is one of several murals he painted um, with the theme of the Canterbury Tales. These are hidden away in the basement of the theater at University of Holy Names in Oakland. So they're kind of a neighborhood project. They used to be on display at the Canterbury Hotel over on Sutter, and they went back and forth a couple times between the university and the hotel, and now they're um, at the Performing Arts Building in, in Oakland. The sad thing is that they're downstairs kind of behind the scenes, and so you really have to know what you're looking for and ask permission to kind of go behind the stage and, and see them. And, and it's real sad that they're out of public view because they're really amazing. What's the size? Um, the size, uh, it varies a little bit. Some are as wide or as long as the screen, mm -hmm. I would say, and then maybe four feet high. Mm -hmm. That would maybe be an average. So. He was an architect. This building is still standing. He designed the building. I, have actually had a chance to look at the blueprints and they've got his name on them. Uh, it's kind of a Monterey Spanish style. Um, the people who live in the house totally appreciate that it was designed by Joe Moore. They love that. Where is it? It's in um, the Mesa area of Monterey. Um, so, so he was a designer. I think that um, someone else kind of grouped these pieces together as a way to describe that work of his. Uh, so everything from the 
painted design on the milk bottle. He designed the 75th anniversary 50 cent piece for the state of California, which was actually U.S. currency. This was one of um, 12 menus, the menu cover that he did, each one telling a different story, a different aspect of Joe's, of, of California history, excuse me. Two book plates, one for each of his children, Patty and Joey, and then a wine label that I don't think was ever used, but um, that was not uncommon for Joe to do a design of something with the hopes that it would be bought and used. Um, this one I never saw, I only have it as, as the original drawing, so I don't think it was ever printed. So, a designer. He was an actor. This is Joe as the bad man <laughs> uh, in a play in Carmel. A sculptor. Uh, this is Marie Antonia Field, who was responsible for one of the restoration eras for the Carmel Mission in Carmel. And he did this in honor of her. It still sits in the Joe Moore Chapel on the mission grounds now. Uh, it's bronze, and I'd say it's about this tall, very heavy. And then a sculptor again, working totally different mediums. This is marble. These, the last time I saw them, were out on display at the De Young Museum upstairs. Uh, and Hopi man, a Hopi woman, uh, probably did circa 1910. So this was after the time that he spent living with the Hopi. And here he is as a father and a husband. So we see him with his son Joey, Joe Jr., and daughter Patty, and his wife Grace. And they would, um, this is up in Yosemite, and oh, we'll talk a little bit more about Yosemite in a minute. And now, so that, that was probably 1920. Um, that photo, this photo goes back to his, more of his childhood. And so now we've, we're, we've got a sense of how versatile he is as an artist. Now we're going to talk a little bit about him and his personal life and his adventures. But this is a family photo that I've always liked. This is his father, Domingo. Domingo was a classical sculptor, trained as and worked as a sculptor. His brother, Luis, is, was a classical painter in very much the style, well, one of his paintings was the presidential portrait of President Harding that is in the Capitol and in Washington. And so, and both of them were, I wouldn't quite say myopic, but they were, they were very focused on the singular art form. So his dad is a sculptor, his brother is a painter. And then Joe, this is Joe here, um, Joe's mom, and um, Luis's girlfriend, you just sort of see her right up there at the time, uh, fiance. And so this is 1891. So Joe was, um, he was born in 1876. He was born in Uruguay. His father was Catalan. His mother was French. Uh, they moved, to, they actually met in Uruguay. Um, Luis was born, a couple years later Joe was born. And their parents decided that it, there was enough political unrest in Uruguay at the time that they decided they didn't want to bring their kids up there. And so they moved back to Barcelona for a short period of time. And then from there, they moved to the east coast of the United States. And that's where Joe grew up, uh, was on the east coast. And they, it, his father was also following commissions. I mean, he was constantly looking for work as would Joe throughout his life. Um, but, and he found, he did do some actual work in Uruguay, but he found he was much more able to, to find work once he got to the United States. And so, and this, I'm glad we have some young people here. So this is Joe's work. He was um, nine years old when he did these little drawings. Yeah, the first thing I have to say is I absolutely love the fact that his parents kept all of this material. Mm -hmm. I mean, that right there is just a miracle and to me. And I wouldn't be standing here if they hadn't been so 
um, conscientious about keeping the things that their children created. So this is a drawing that Joe did on a notebook. Um, and he did this, he seemed to always have pencil and paper in hand. He would draw pictures, he would write stories. Um, another illustration that was, you know, part of a story that he had written. Uh, just a very fertile imagination and was constantly working um, as a young boy. We'll train. So, and, and what's the most obvious part about this is not so much the quality of it at this point as it is the, the enthusiasm, I think. And so that he's, as a young child, he's already, you know, totally grossed in art. Then, um, in, the, in those days, uh, geography and map making was actually part of the curriculum, the school curriculum. So he was, I think, in about, um, about nine years old when he did this, and it's Europe, obviously, and it's the first known map that we have that Joe actually executed himself. So it's kind of fun to see it historically and to see the progression. We saw the Los Angeles cart, so that those are the two extremes, from this very first one to, to the Los Angeles one, which was about the last one that he did. But this got in his bones early in his life. Another illustration, kind of gruesome, um, but from another story. He loved the idea of cowboys and Indians, and that may not be politically correct way to describe it, but at the time, it was the way he would have described it. And these, in fact, are two Indians fighting each other. Um, he had a real good sense of American history. You know, from the time he was a young boy, he was very interested in it. And this is an example, again, in a notebook um, with his story and you know, just an illustration um, as he would write. Another example. And then we do get, he gets a little older, and then we start to get a sense of the quality of his work. So these are uh, much more sophisticated sketches, um, kind of like doing anatomy drawings. Um, you know, and they, this would have been, he was still on the East Coast, so he, he might have been, you know, 15, 20. He did go to art schools um, when he finished uh, grade school. And he also worked with his dad uh, and mentored with his dad. But I just think it's real interesting to see this sophistication um, become part of his work. So we, we know, we learn early on that he, he can walk the walk. I mean, he really understands how to draw and he's good at it. And so then when he departs from more traditional drawings like this, um, it's when he brings his own creativity to it. Such as this. <laughs> so this was an illustration in the Boston Herald. And this was one of his first paid jobs, was being an illustrator for the Boston Herald. And this was in the days before there were photographs in newspapers. Uh, so the only way for a visual to be part of the paper was if it was a drawing. And Joe did this. Um, he got to know the editor. He would be paid for this. Um, and so this is an example of, of one of those drawings. Another example. And again, what's so wonderful is that Joe's mom made scrap, uh, scrapbooks out of all of the times that Joe was published in the paper. So. Um, and what I loved about this one is it pertains to an art club. And uh, so you see the paintings and the wall and the sculpture and then the, the patrons um, at the exhibit. And he also started illustrating books. So this is an example of an illustration from a story. Oftentimes, publishers would reprint books like Hans Christian Andersen and um, Aesop's Fables. You know, they would, they would print a copy, they would print an edition, and then it would sell out, and then they would reprint it with a new illustrator. And Joe fell into that um, very naturally. And so he's you know, about 25 years old when he's doing this. 
and he's earning an income, and he's saving his money. And I wanted to show you some, a little bit of contrast. And the picture on the left was a calendar that he did, I think, in 1903. And that's just one illustration. The design of the calendar was those long verticals. And then years later, 30 years later, this is uh, the same animal, yet rendered as an illustration for, from a children's book that he did. So I think it's, um, and you can, you, you, throughout the exhibit here, you can see how, the way I describe it is that his edges kind of softened as he got older. And so I find, although, the, you know, there's an edge to, to this illustration as well, but it's, it's, in my mind, a little softer than the one he did when he was younger. And I will attribute that to a happy marriage and two happy children, mm -hmm. as his children. So Joe is, um, he gets wanderlust. And he's been on the East Coast, he's grown up, he loved the idea of the American West, he saw the Buffalo Bill Wild West show and was totally intrigued with the ideas. We talked about cowboys and Indians, and he decided he wanted to see it for himself. So he boarded a train in Boston and came to California. He, his goal was to see the Hopi snake dance in Arizona. And the snake dance is a seasonal dance. It doesn't uh, have a calendar date that you could say, oh, I need to be there on November 4th. It, it varies year to year. So he came west to, with that intent. He went through Arizona, um, got to California, um, met up with some family friends in the San Jose area, and decided to kick around a little bit. He went down to the San Ynez Valley and then lived on the Donahue Ranch for several um, months. And at that point, he realized he had missed the dance. So then he's got a year to kill, basically, before the next one. So what he does is he gets on his horse, and he's learned all these ways of the cowboy. He understands horsemanship you know, to a fault. And having lived with it and witnessed it and done it himself, he rides over the San Marcos Pass from San Diego's Valley to Santa Barbara, gets on a boat in Santa Barbara with his horse, Lady. They sail down to San Diego. They get off the boat, and he rides horseback from San Diego up to San Juan Batista. So that's all of Southern and most of Central California. He follows the um, Portola expedition, a copy of Crespi's diary from the time that they actually did that in the 1700s. He has a copy of that, he has his bedroll, he has a sketch pad, he has his watercolors and pencils, he has one of the first cameras, and he has a journal, which started out being blank. And he literally rides horseback by himself that entire way, and he follows the El Camino Real, stopping at all the missions um, that he passed along the way. And, Every time he'd stop, he would do drawings or watercolors. Uh, this is the San Juan Capistrano bells, in, just in pencil lead. Uh, and it was, and his journal is so engrossing, but it's not very reflective. It's really, he, he talks about what he's doing, and at one point he loses Lady, she gets loose, and it takes him four pages to get her back. But, um, <laughs> But he finally does. But he doesn't reflect on what he's doing so much as describe it, I guess, if, there's, if that makes sense as a distinction. Um, but he, you know, and then just does these beautiful gouaches. Um, this is Mission San Luis Rey. Um, and again, this is 1903 that he's doing this. A lot of the missions were falling apart at that point, historically. Um, the Santa Barbara mission. And he painted one of the Padres that was there. And the, so there, there's a set of about 25 images from these sketchbooks. And this one always kind of gave me the creeps. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, this is the only one of a person. 
And I would look at this and I'd go, that just, you know, maybe Joe just wasn't a very good painter of people and portraits. And I don't know, it just kind of seemed weird to me. It just seemed odd until I found the photograph that it was based on. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized it was spot on. <laughs> what did I know? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's just an image. This painting was perfect. Um, so it was... Uh, that's when I realized I went in and way over my head with this guy. <laughs> uh, he still had a little more time uh, before he needed to head east to Arizona. He then went up to the Sierras, and he, there were family friends that he was staying with, and, and he was kind of toying with the idea of going into the gold mining business. And, um, but he lived up there. He was an outstanding hunter and um, spent some time there, and then finally, kind of the timing was set that he needed to head east. So a friend of his from back east had come to join him, Honey Williams, and the two of them set off from San Jose in a Studebaker wagon, which a buckboard wagon. They had two mules, um, Tom and Jerry, that sold the wagon. Yes, named after the drink thing. Um, and they headed east. Uh, and they went through the Central Valley into Yosemite. They spent about two weeks in Yosemite. They were there in the middle of the summer. For, they were there for the 4th of July. Again, he's doing artwork as he goes. He's taking pictures. He's making entries in his journal, every day of which started out by saying, woke up, made cocoa. Um, <laughs> so he just about lived on cocoa. Uh, but he played baseball in the valley floor, you know, on the 4th of July. He did a hike up to Granite, um, um, up, Glacier thank you, Glacier Point, and down again in about five hours. Yeah, I told this story to rangers in Yosemite on occasion, and they, their jaws just dropped. They just, that's not even possible. Um, but for Joe, that was a day's hike for him. And then he did the Yosemite cart many years later. Uh, but what's fun about this, and it, I'm sorry I didn't do close-ups, but a lot of it is, there's little bits of this that are anecdotal. Um, and one part references his, that hike that I just described. And you can see him looking out over Nevada Falls with his camera. And you can see probably him with Honey at one of the campsites. Um, so it was um, a fun little bit. And then there's uh, this picture over here. Uh, it's titled, Oh My, um, The First View, I think. And I always thought that was maybe Joe and his wife and, and the kids, the first time the family was all there. And then his maps, and this is where his sense of humor comes in. Um, Bridal Bill Falls is being overlooked by a woman in her wedding dress. <laughs> um, Clouds Rest has a cloud with arms and legs. and. So there's all kinds of wonderful visual um, puns here. This is Washington Column. Of course, George Washington standing on top of it. <laughs> so it just gives you a sense of his uh, sense of humor um, as well. Oh, I did include close-ups. Good for me. Okay. So there's uh, the first view, and then Mirror Lake. And then probably Joe and Honey. And then this, um, he, he would reference Yosemite over the course of his life whenever opportunities would present themselves. This was an advertisement in the Los Angeles Times to entice people to come up to Yosemite. And the whole, well, the whole visual is put together by Joe, um, but then you get to see the characters that are, you know, he does throughout his career. And then he finally gets to Arizona, and he absolutely fell in love with being with the Hopi and the Navajo. Um, he spent two and a half years there. He learned to speak Hopi. He learned to speak Navajo, both of which are, in my, for my ear, incredibly complicated, difficult languages. Um, he painted a series of 40 Katsina figures. This is one of the examples. He actually painted the series and then realized that they had changed part of what they were wearing. Um, so it was kind of not uh, necessarily 
give away all their secrets. Um, when he realized that, he tore them all up, and then he said, we're going to do it all over again. And he said, I really need you to be honest about this, and they respected him enough that they said, okay. And so he did the whole series again. Uh, these are now in the Smithsonian, the originals. Mm -hmm. um, these are, when I saw these, and they were, a long story, but they were printed as, uh, eight of the 40 were printed as a, an edition that were sold at some point. The owner of, the, of them before they ended up in the Smithsonian um, printed them as a set. And when I saw those, it was, that was the tipping point for me in terms of falling in love with Joe Moore. And I had already been very, very infatuated, but um, I had a pre-existing interest in Hopi material and Navajo material um, throughout my childhood and into my adulthood. And I had never seen anybody paint like this, these figures in such an exquisite and detailed manner. And, it just absolutely blew me away, and I realized I'm hooked uh, when I saw these. And that was about 20 years ago, so, and I guess I'm still hooked. What medium was that? Uh, well, watercolor. Those were watercolors. Watercolor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oftentimes, he would take a photograph and use that as the reference point or for a drawing. Uh, so this again would have been done while he was at Hopi. Other, another glimpse, there's probably, oh, 10 or 15 pieces that are similar to this in terms of the architecture of the Pueblos and um, the people um, that were there as well, again, 1904. Um, he moved very smoothly between the mesas, um, and it, it was, um, they, they actually ended up consulting him about a Kachina figure, Katsina figure, which Again, that's what this is based on. Um, he had a medicine man come to him because he had noticed that Joe had a bird book, and he was trying to the, he was trying to get some information. And he talked to Joe, and they went through the book and discovered the bird that they were looking for. And then he used that for a kachina. He was invited into ceremonies in Kivas, which for a non Hopi is kind of unprecedented, um, and. So he, he was um, another more fully executed painting that he did while he was there. Um, he, was, he, he went there to understand them and to learn about them and to be with them. And um, it was, they got that, they, they understood. And, um, and it worked, it worked both directions. Um, they, he, ended up living um, in a house that was owned by Napeo, who in the early 1900s was probably the first Hopi potter who it had established any name recognition. Um, and so it was, he spent time with E.A. Burbank, who was another artist and did a lot of work with Native Americans. Um, they lived together for a period of time. So it was just, it was an amazing time in his life. And he, at some point, wrote home and just said, if I don't leave now, I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. I mean, it, it became that important to him. So it happened to be that while he was living there, he did make a couple of trips back to San Jose, and he had a honey there. And he decided, well, okay, if I'm not going to live here the rest of my life, maybe I'm going to go back to San Jose and ask Grace if she'll marry me. Um, so he did, in fact, do that. He did it knowing that he had just been given a commission to do Sunday comics for the Boston Herald. And so this is an example of which we've also got a bunch out here in the exhibit of a Sunday comic that he did for a year. Um, every Sunday, a full page, and that was the style in the day. We're used to the, you know, sub, the multiple um, square images. but. He, he not only wrote the limericks, but he also did the illustrations, and he did this for a full year, which paid him very well and um, kind of helped facilitate his moving back to California. They ended up living in the Mountain View area, um, buying a ranch there. He traveled around Los Angeles, met uh, Charles Loomis, 
um, signed the autograph book at the public library and illustrated it as many artists did um, at the time. So this is 1907. And then once he got up to the Bay Area, uh, he started working on projects in San Francisco. And at that time, his dad moved and mom moved out as well. So he was still kind of apprenticing with his dad. And this is the uh, Native Sons of the Golden West building on Mason, and which still stands today. It's slightly, it looks slightly different because there is a theater um, marquee in this area right here um, that partially, it, it partially blocks some of the decorative elements that Joe did on the building. But he told, you know, six, there are six panels here that are sort of different eras of California history. There's also medallions around the door that feature different people out of California history. So this was one of the projects that they worked on together. And this is my favorite family picture. So this is Joe with his son, Joey, when he's about three years old, helping him on one of those panels that was on the building. And these are the 49ers, you know, panning for gold. And I just always love that picture. And again, another marble piece. This is Poppy Girl. This was in the um, Pan Pacific Exposition um, here in San Francisco. And a version of this is in the library in Niles, down outside of San Jose, uh, the Niles Library. Only open one day a week. Yeah, that's right. It's hard to get to and <laughs> get in. Yeah. And this is uh, currently the Ritz-Carlton um, Hotel up on Knob Hill. Uh, Joe worked on the decorative pediment up here. Uh, at the time, it was the Metropolitan Life Insurance Building, um, but even though it's been repurposed, the, that element has stayed the same. So now we're kind of into his career as, as a sculptor, and um, he's now become a father. And this is an example of pediment in his studio, where he would work in clay first, and then they would cast it using, you know, plat make plat plaster molds, and keep working. That was in the Mountain View area? Um, no, no, I'm sorry. This, this one studio. is in San Francisco. This is on, um, <coughs> uh, the other one's on Mason. This is on Bush. It's on Bush. Oh, no, well, the, the Ritz-Carlton's up on Knob Hill, but then this building um, is on Bush. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, you can walk to about six of these buildings. Um, I always start at the Ritz-Carlton and send the walkers downhill. But, <laughs> um, um, and this building has, this is, I think, 350 Bush, and it's just recently been repurposed. And I haven't been in it since they finished. I, I'm not sure they're totally finished yet, but they were going to do a history display in the lobby, and I hope I, I provided some material for them, and I hope that they used it, but I haven't been there to, to check that out yet. And then we head over to Van Ness. This is 1000 Van Ness, and this is uh, the, what was the former Cadillac dealership on Van Ness, owned, I believe, by Earl Anthony. And the picture is divided into segments so you can see all of his work but he he did Joe did this which was kind of an ode to commerce and the wheels are different symbolic of different wheels on Cadillacs and the spokes and it's got the Cadillac crest in the middle and then Joe loved bears as a symbol of California um, particularly cubs um, as the young bears were, it was the young state, you know, when Joe's history starts. Um, so this building is still here. It is, um, at various times, somebody thought to paint this part of it, uh, which didn't ever make sense. I think they've removed the paint since I last saw it, uh, which is a good thing. He would show his artwork while he was living in this area. What, once his dad moved um, out, they also opened a studio in San Francisco. So they would commute between Mountain View and San Francisco. My research told me that it's where Macy's is, right on Union Square now is where the studio was. But this was a gallery where he exhibited some of his sculptures. Um, 
the building is still there, but it's, and I think in fact it's even still a gallery, but it's no longer the Vickery um, Atkins. A bronze plaque that he did in honor of uh, Bishop um, Patrick Reardon. This has not, all I have of this is this photograph. I have not been able to find the actual piece. And key to so much of this was Joe's membership in the Bohemian Club. He knew once he got to California and got sort of settled and going that he wanted to be a member of the Bohemian Club. And so this is Joe right here um, in the bar at the club. And um, I probably could be hung for showing this photograph but because mm -hmm. it's such a private club. But he, it was pivotal in Joe's career in terms of the people that he met and people who would then in the future um, commission him to do projects and pay him, you know, loan him money sometimes when he was low on funds. But it was just, it was a really, really important, and it really continued through the rest of his life. So he's about um, uh, 40, he's about 35 at this point, and it was, you know, for the rest, he died in 1947, so for the rest of his life, this was really important for him professionally. Are those some of his works? The frame um, and the bear? Those are works by other members of the club. I don't think any of those are Joe's, but there are a number of pieces in the club that he did do um, that are still there, and including, and this is the one kind of relief, there's, there's a bronze plaque on the exterior of the building that's an ode to um, Twain Hart, and um, that is... Joe's work, and that the public could see that. The public's not invited. It's a private club, yeah. and so the public's not invited um, to it. But I've been fortunate to know a couple people who gave me a tour. Oh, in fact, there we go. Right. So the Bret Hart panel. So this you can still, if the ivy's been trimmed, um, <laughs> then you can still see this. Um, and it, this, it's at Post and Taylor, is where the building is, I think. And the, the unveiling of this was a big deal. It was covered by the newspapers and that stuff. So it's a, it's a very nice piece. The club is still active? And yes, very active. Yes. Yep. Uh, this is a mantelpiece that is in a home in Berkeley. And I was told about this. And I generally have enough gumption to follow up on leads and knock on doors and things, and I think the person who recognized it was on a home tour. Um, so it's a beautiful, beautiful old craftsman-style house. As you, there are many up in Berkeley. And so I eventually got to see that in person, the owner let me in, and um, so I was able to take pictures. He did this with his father, so it would go back to the early 1900s. Close up. Is it marble? It's probably plaster. Oh. Yeah. How did he acquire Oops, it? Sorry. Well, um, was it commissioned by him? Or? He, I think it was, it was commissioned to be built into place in the house. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, one of the people he met through the Bohemian Club was Senator James Phelan, and they actually worked together on this fountain, which is a uh, Phelan's estate in Saratoga, Villa Montavo. It's, on, it's in a little courtyard outside of the library room. And Joe, of course, did the sculpting, and, but then Phelan wrote the poem that's in the top over on the left. And it, it's bronze. The um, photographs are black and white, but the materials were bronze. He then went into training for the First World War. Uh, the training started up in San Rafael, and he ended up in Kentucky. He had time to do very little artwork while over this period of time during the training because he was so, the training itself was so demanding. What happened was he finally, he ended up graduating first in his class. He was considerably older than most of the people in the training program, but he, I mean, we have a wonderful record of the letters he wrote home 
during this period. That's about all he had time to do was to write letters as opposed to artwork, although this is one exception that was a, a program that he did. But he, he had to work really, really hard to get through training. And he kept kicking himself for not paying enough attention while he was in grade school and everything else, all the things he had forgotten that would have helped him get through the training program. But sure enough, he ended up um, graduating first as a military major, and he finished his training, and within days, the war was over. And so he never got to serve. Well, that would, on one hand, be a huge relief, but it actually, he wrote a letter to his wife, and it absolutely broke his heart, because he had worked so hard to get through the training, and with the sole purpose of going off and fighting for his country, and he didn't get a chance to do that. So it's just, well, it's just kind of ironic, but we're, I'm glad he didn't go. And he had, in fact, um, going back to the gallery that we looked at the program, before he left, he destroyed numerous sculptures that were in a plaster form, because he didn't want anything to happen to, to them if he didn't come back from the training. He was afraid they could fall into hands of somebody less accomplished in terms of casting them, so he destroyed them all. And fortunately, he remade a lot of them afterwards. So this is Joe with the cenotaph that he created in honor of Father Sarah. It's in what's called the Mora Chapel now, which is right next to the mission main mission building. And this is the piece that he did um, in that case which he considered at the time to be the supreme sculptural project of, or really the supreme artistic project of his career. And while well, then he settled into the Carmel area and Pebble Beach, uh, he would illustrate and send out Christmas cards, of which we have some wonderful examples here. Don't you think you would look forward to getting one of those each oh, year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then this is probably the first published map that he was responsible for. This is the uh, end papers of a book called Don and the Dons by Tierney Ford. And it's a not very highly thought of history of Monterey and, and a little bit of California, but Joe illustrated it. And so it, it was, again, the early 90s. Teen teens, and so came about as a result of Joe living in the area. And again, what I like about it is it probably is his first published map. <coughs> and then he got fancier, and so this is 1942 or 45, and uh, we have the original pen and ink of this here in the exhibit. Uh, and this is the second one he did of California. He did the first one he did in 1927. This one was in the 40s, the early 40s, and it was smaller in size. I mean, it, both of them were California, um, you know, south to north, but um, I think they figured that the first one, which we have here in the exhibit, is pretty big, and I think they kind of realized, well, who's got enough room on their walls for something that gigantic? And so they just did a smaller version of it. And I, I just love, he takes Nevada, you know, I mean, which could have been just empty space. But on the top half, he tells the history of California <laughs> through costume and clothing. And then he tells the same history through transportation. I mean, it just, how does it, anybody get to be that clever? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, there's a good example of him starting <coughs> work in pencil. You get a sense of the scale of the original drawings um, that he worked on. I um, mean, what he had to go through to, just to execute the drawings. And a little self-portrait that he did, you know, working on the same one. It's got all the characters that are in the costumes that I showed you, and they're all watching him. And one of the people he met you know, on the Monterey Peninsula was S.F.P. Morris, and who would go on to... Um, buy and operate the Hotel Del Monte. And they were, they became very good friends. Joe did a lot of work for him. 
Uh, this is one example of illustrating a cocktail book. Uh, and this is just a real little booklet. Um, but there was a very important relationship. Um, and Joe is one of the, well, here's an example of one of the inside um, illustrations. I think this is the same page that's turned to um, in the case here. We have this here on display. And then, of course, Joe added a cocktail. And his is kind of curious, and um, I'm not quite sure how that would taste. But I have to, you have to read Theodore Dreiser's uh, author of the American Tragedy, and it's two glasses of gin, <laughs> plus the juice of one grapefruit and the juice of half a lemon. It's not jiggers, it's glasses. <laughs> so. That would be tragic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, another example of a piece he did for the Hotel Del Monte, this is the cover of an invitation um, to a New Year's party. So these commissions um, were how Joe made his living. He's one of the rare artists who never um, had any other source of income besides his artwork. And raised a wife, and he lived with his wife, raised two children, kept food on the table, kept clothes on their backs, lived in a nice house, and it was all through his artistic talent, which um, kind of impresses me no end. There's not a lot of people who really succeeded that way artistically. This is an example of a sketch that he did for what would become the decorative elements on the King City High School Auditorium in King City, which is at the south end of, the, of Salinas Valley. And what the pen and ink drawing was the first step in his work. Uh, he then made cast, this is clay, life-size clay versions of it, so he carved those, and then they were cast into um, concrete and actually placed on the building. Um, and again, it gives you a sense of the scale by seeing Joe, you know, sort of kneeling down there at the base. This building is one of the two that he worked on that were part of the WPA program. And they were, um, he worked with the same architect, Robert Stanton, who he knew from Pebble Beach. They were neighbors. Um, Stanton was the architect. Joe was the artistic coordinator, if you will, or, and designer. The WPA program buildings, most were required to have an artistic component to them. That was just kind of the way it went when you signed on to do a building. And so their relationship was just outstanding and it worked out beautifully in both cases. Is uh, that building still? That building is still there, yeah, and it's just wonderful. You can walk around the outside of it and he did not only did he do the front, which has, there's actually nine of these panels on the finished building, and then on both sides of the building, there are very, very tall columns, and there's decorative elements at the tops of the columns as well that you almost need a telephoto lens to see carefully. But, um, but yes, that building is still there. It's now on the National Register of Historic Places. The other building he did was the Monterey County Courthouse in Salinas, and I don't know if I have pictures of that or not. But, um, but here, another example from, this is from one of the uh, citizens' training camp annuals, um, so another drawing, another heroic sculpture. This is one of four that he did that are in Oklahoma. This is... Uh, same style of work that he did when, from one we saw earlier, um, the Carmel Mission. Another one of the pieces that's over at Holy Names. And then another story to tell you. Um, the Drakoch Hotel of Drake Wilshire is now Campton Place Hotel, Taj Place, right or just half a block off of Union Square in San Francisco. At the time, it was the Hotel Drake Wilshire, 
and they had a little restaurant in the hotel called The Fable. So Joe was commissioned to do the menu illustrations, but also to paint murals that would decorate the restaurant. And those murals, that, of which these are two examples, um, and we have these in the case as well, but the murals disappeared at some point. There were a change of ownership, and I, along with a colleague, we kind of went crazy trying to find them. The story went that they had been given to the Children's Hospital here in San Francisco, which kind of made total sense. But we couldn't find anybody at the Children's Hospital that knew anything about it. And so they weren't even in the basement. We, you know, we just they, we drew an absolute blank. Turned out that somebody had acquired them and kind of put them away. And did tell one other person, a gentleman who owns um, a gallery down in um, Pacific Grove. And well, we can go back to that. Um, and swore him to secrecy. He said, if you tell anybody I have these, I'm never going to sell them to you. And he, he had actually offered them for sale, but said, when I'm ready, I will call you. But if you tell anybody, deal's off. Well, Terry didn't tell anybody. I'm, literally years went by. Um, and I thought they were lost. My colleagues thought they were lost. Um, and the man finally did call and said, I've got these, I'm ready to sell them. And Terry said, I'll buy them. Terry took them to be cleaned, which did, they didn't require much cleaning. They are now on display at his gallery in Pacific Grove. There are seven of them all together. They, I'll pay for your gas to go see them. I mean, they are unbelievable. And they're as clean and beautiful and bright as the day they were painted. And they're, this, again, the size of the screen. I mean, they're just these beautiful, beautiful murals. Um, so, you know, we just totally lucked out and they are still with us. So, so they were painted on? Something like masonite, yeah. And Joe did, I mean, thanks for asking that. Joe did, well, in fact, this is Joe in his studio. And again, um, here he's working on one of the panels for this Monterey County Courthouse. Those are two of them. This is his son, Joey. This is one of the panels from the fable, and then this is another one. So it gives you a sense of the height and the size of them. And he would he did work on these things in his studio, as opposed to on a scaffolding laying on his back and uh, on site. And I think that um, that was just the most convenient way for him to do it. And he could do it at home that way, because his studio was really part of his home. Um, so they were on what would have been like a masonite material and could be transported. Which gallery in Pacific Grove? It's called the Trotter Gallery. Yep. Here's an example of one of the murals. Um, that in the case here that we have this material, there are three postcards that illustrate five of the seven murals. This is one that's not illustrated. And for this area, it's totally cool because it's Stanford and Cal um, <laughs> with the, um, the two football animals. So, um, <laughs> and the, the other little twist to this story about the hotel is this is a, um, is a co coated bas relief. Um, it's probably the majority of the material is plaster, and then they put sort of a finish or patina on it that was like um, copper. It looks like copper. And this was done originally in the employee dining room downstairs. Well, when I was told about it, um, and again, wiggled my way in to actually see it, it was set into the wall, and it was also behind a big metal rack of pots and pans. Oh. I mean, so they had totally lost any sense of any value to it. Um, but it is still there, and it was in fairly good condition. So, but again, it's built into the wall, so the public, unfortunately, I'm not sure will ever have access um, to see it. But another piece that was part of the hotel's um, work. And then we get to our comics that are why we're here in this venue tonight. And these are, um, this is one, Zip is one of the three comic strips that Joe um, drew and never had 
it's never saw published. They never, nobody would ever buy the series or even any one of the series um, to publish them. And he pitched them to William Randolph first, and they ended up having political differences. They didn't see eye to eye um, politically, and so I think I don't know who pulled out of the project first, but. Um, they never got published, and, and it's this is, as one of three series that are here that really is why I wanted this um, them to be on display for the first time here at the Cartoon Art Museum. And then, so we, then he would also do what he called Bolognias, and he would do this for his children and his wife on holidays or occasion of birthdays. He would write a little limerick that reflected on the previous year and then illustrate it. Um, so it's pretty cool having a dad who would do that for you. So. And this is another mantelpiece that he did uh, that's in Los Angeles. This relates to the Cadillac building on Van Ness in that this estate was built by the same Earl Anthony and it, eventually was sold and became a convent. Uh, fairly recently, the, the nuns that were part of the um, order were by attrition, there weren't too many left, and so they realized they needed to sell the building. And it's a beautiful estate. I mean, it's, it's in the Los Feliz part of Los Angeles, up on a hill, and it's like a mini Hertz castle. It's just amazing residence. Uh, and when I went to the building to look for this mantelpiece, it was covered by an altar, a temporary kind of wooden altar that they were using for, for church and mass. So, you know, so that made sense, but it was frustrating not to be able to see it. Um, but in any case, what's happened since is they put it on the market. The person who expressed interest in it uh, is Katy Perry. Um, so if you listen to current pop music, <laughs> Katy Perry is kind of up there along with Beyonce and folks like that. Um, well, the nuns listened to her music, and they weren't real impressed. <laughs> uh, and so they kind of withdrew their offer to sell it. And she's actually suing, because they really had no legal grounds to do that. Um, it was real discrimination. Um, but so, And I don't know where it stands right now in terms of the legal process, but um, what I, my motivation was to make sure that whoever buys, the, who buys it knows what they have here. So I actually talked to the lawyer who was working on the case, and I just said, I'm going to just send you some stuff just so you know, so you can get it to the right person if the time comes. Right. And then um, another... He, Joe didn't do a lot of commercial pieces, but this was a cover of the magazine. Uh, an indication of how he would go from sketches to final product. This is a border on the Los Angeles part, so we see the um, pencil drawing on the left and then the finished printed version. This also gets into the whole question of political correctness and um, because we do have what would have been a black person, but in black face. Um, and there's a little bit of that that pops up in Joe's work, but it isn't um, any different than what was kind of commonplace at the time. And it's I would, a specific reference to the jazz singer, though, isn't it? Well, it is. So, I mean, that was a popular movie at the time. And, you know, so he wasn't, um, I don't think he was making any comment other than depicting what was going on you know, in the socially. Movie. Yeah. It's in the movie. Yeah, yeah. So, and it doesn't happen often, but it, every so often. And then again, this is um, an illustration from California's, the other sort of companion piece that I mentioned to Trail Dust and Saddle Leather. And what I think I included here, I hope it's just kind of showing you um, his process a little. So how he would, you know, sketch and, and re-sketch. And so there's three versions and they get more detailed um, as he goes along until he then finally finishes the design and adds the color to it. And so these are the original, you know, pages that he worked on 
um, to get to the cover, which is right there. And then uh, I showed you the, well, no, in fact, I haven't yet. But, um, so raise your hand if you remember Leave It to Beaver. Wally. Okay, well, this is Wally, and there's Theodore. Yeah. And in Theodore's bedroom is Joe's poster of the American Indians. Uh, so I thought that's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, it popped up, um, so there's a little popular culture bit. Um, his work's been used on labels for beer bottles. Is that old or new as far as um, the this, this This one, it, it's an old drawing, but it's, uh, oh, maybe eight years to, ago that they did this. Yeah. So. I have, this is the um, Al Drugstore Company, and I haven't been able to verify totally that this is Joe's work, but it certainly could be, and I did find one reference that implied maybe it was. But this would have also, um, the owl is a symbol for the Bohemian Club. And so there, it, it just kind of, it's a maybe. Um, I, I, and here's the original um, cowboy piece that Joe did. Um, the difference, what happened was what Joe did this in 1933 for the Salinas Rodeo, what they call a rodeo. And, you notice up here, there's a little map and then another little map over here. Well, when they sold the rights to the rodeo and quickly realized that they wanted it back. But so what Joe did then was changed it. Um, and let's see if we have, we'll go back. Um, he changed these two sections and turned them, it's, they're now yellow fields with black silhouettes of different um, cowboys on horseback. Most of the time that you see this poster, that's what you'll see is one of the second or you know third generation. Um, and it was just a way for them to can maintain you know, a new copyright on it so that they could keep printing it and keep selling it. And Joey did that for his dad. Joey, his son, was kind of his business person and would go around and go to trading posts in the southwest and sell these images and um, and it kept the family in shelter and clothing during the depression believe it or people were willing to spend 50 cents on these and it was income for the family and it really made a big difference um, this is probably the piece that joe's most well known for because it was printed in the largest number um, over the years you know it's probably 10,000 copies of, it's been reprinted several times and always it's been authorized. Um, the big sign in the window is Levi Strauss, the Blue Jean Company. They bought use of it. Um, the image we have here is the California Beef Council. They bought use of it. And then in the 60s, um, if you look up here, the um, birds, the rock and well, in fact, we'll, we'll get back to that, to the birds in a minute. Um, here, the image was used for the National Day of the Cowboy. Um, this is the cover of the Birds album. So they used that and rearranged it a little bit by you know, changing the location of some of the graphics. But what I always appreciated about this, and it was probably Chris Hillman, who was the bass player for the Birds. He actually rides rodeo. And he, I'm sure, is the one who knew about Joe's work and encouraged the band to look to use the image. And what I always appreciated is that Columbia Records, in negotiating the use of it, um, gave Joe credit on the back. Uh, it says illustration by Joe Moore, and that doesn't happen all the time. Lots of times, in fact, the buildings that I showed you in San Francisco, you can't find his name anywhere on them. But, um, so this was... Um, this was uh, all on the up and up. And it's continued to be used. Uh, this is a patch that was made. Chris Hilton still plays rock and roll, and so I've worked with you know his people. Um, they've made a patch that they sell at the concerts, and you can sew that on the back of your Levi's jacket. Um, they just celebrated the 50th anniversary of that album, and they did an anniversary tour. And um, so it was on the drum kit. 
And this is a tattoo of a woman in the audience <laughs> who deliberately was at one of the concerts. Had Joe only known. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool. And then this is a gentleman from Germany who contacted me and said, I'd like to do a tattoo on my calf. So this is his calf. Who was I to say no to that? <laughs> so, uh, he actually asked you for permission. He did ask. Wow. Yeah, he did. Yeah, which yeah, which doesn't always happen. But, um, did he get his name tattooed yeah. on his calf, too? Or uh, um, credit? Yeah, I don't know if he did or not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so this this one really has legs. <laughs> Sorry. And then again, another illustration from one of the books of Joe's that I've always just loved. This with the, you know I picture that it's him, you know, just with his character says his dreams, reading the book. And I couldn't end the evening without a leather road to San Francisco. And this is the, I wish he had done him a cart of San Francisco, but he, this is as close as we have. And this was part of the book that I, um, that he, he created a diary for people called the Log of the Spanish Main. And it was given to passengers on a cruise ship. And it was, he, Joe drew the prompts, and then people could fill in you know, who the passengers were, what the weather was like, different things. There's a whole section in the back about pirates, um, and then the ports of call, of which, in this case, the trip ended in San Francisco. And so this is his um, map of San Francisco. Now, as modest as this one is, I did have occasion to show this to a group of people. And somebody said, oh, I live right there. So, I mean, it works. It's a good, accurate map. And they live in Tiburon. And, you know, so for them, it was very cool. They saw Raccoon Straits, you know, right there. <laughs> um, so. Um, so it, it, it certainly works. I just wish it was, you know, um, filled out more. Hero, and I think that's the last one. Yes, that is. And I'd be happy to answer questions, or including things that you may have seen out in the exhibit. I mean, you've been very patient. I think I went probably more than an hour, but um, but thank you for coming. So his son is still alive? No. Um, he lived to be 98 years old. Uh, passed away about 10 years ago. And he was really shooting for 100 and almost made it. So, but, but we used to get together. I... As my interest developed, I got to a point where I wanted to see more, more, and I knew I needed his permission to do that, and fortunately, living in the Carmel area, it's a small town, and I knew his lawyers and got an introduction, and then we stayed, you know, friends for the rest of his life, and every time I would think of a project, I'd go and talk to him, and we'd have a rum daiquiri together, which was his favorite drink, and... I pitched the idea, and he always said yes, which was very nice. I think he was pleased with what I did. And, um, I kind of took over for what he did for his dad. In a way, the timing was such that I was just there at that time, and he, again, trusted me. And what, um, he, he got to a point where he was... He, he said, I'm 90 years old, can't I just retire? <laughs> and so he was kind of ready to be done with it, and I was there to, you know, just help. And at, those, at that point, there wasn't much to do, but um, I've done more since. And, and the lawyers who represent the estate knew me and, and saw what I was doing, and they've enabled me to keep doing it um, since then. Yes? Um, you mentioned that the, he had political differences with William Randolph first. I can imagine what they are, but I just wanted you to explain that. That's one question. Another question is the. Um, oh, let do that one. I kind of lost it. Yeah. Well, both members. You know, I think, yeah, it, they potentially ran in the same circles, but um, I think Joe just hated, you know, what was going on in Europe. And you know, the whole idea of the wars, and, and saw, I guess, saw 
first as more conservative to a fault, in, at least to the way Joe looked at things. And Joe really had a global view of the world, and he traveled around the world and, you know, was a multicultural person himself based on his parents and, and the languages he spoke. And, and I think he just, I think there was a, it's not that Joe was necessarily liberal, because I'm not sure how liberal he was, but he, I think, opposed the conservative, um, you know, way of, for her. Yeah. And speaking of which, you mentioned the Bohemian Club, but the Bohemian Club of Joe Mora is not the Bohemian Club of today. So yeah. Can you, can yeah. Well, I think I think that's true, and and I'm not necessarily the best person to talk about it today. But um, what I what I understand, it was it started out as a gathering place for artists and Bohemians and people who there were writers, there were painters. Uh, very, very creative people, and they were, uh, Maynard Dixon was a member, um, it's a long list of important artists who were members, um, Xavier Martinez, um, of the club. And they, they're saying kind of is, well, I could, well, they don't talk business while they're at the club. I mean, it's, it was like their place to go to get away from their day-to-day -day lives. And... So it was very interesting, creative people. It's, I think, changed. It was also, at some points in its history, very, very conservative people. Very conservative people. I mean, some of the most conservative presidents of the United States we've had. And so there was that, that I think, comes a little more towards modern times. And then currently, I think there may be slightly moving back a little, and I think they've opened it up to younger people, and you don't have to be the president of AT&T necessarily, um, and this is my sense of the people I've met more recently, that they're, they're looking, it's kind of getting a little bit more back to its roots and, and a little more open-minded stuff. And I, again, there may be a member sitting here who could elaborate better than me, but, um, but that's my sense anyways. And, and Joe was um, the political part of it. Well, he, he, I don't know, he did some artwork for them that they wouldn't display. So, I mean, he, he didn't, it wasn't always just, you know, complimentary and, oh, you know, thank you. It was, he did some stuff that was a little edgy. And um, I have some letters that he wrote to his wife. And, um, you know, she, he explained that, that, oh, they, you know, wouldn't let me hang this one, and so I had to do something else and, and stuff. But um, that's kind of my sense of that. Well, let's give him a Does Mountain View know he lived there? Well, there, I'm pretty sure there is a, still a road that's called either Mora Lane or Mora Road, and so, yeah, and there's a house that I think is the house that they lived in, um, at least I, when I knocked on that door too, um, the people seemed to acknowledge that, yeah, they knew that it was there. So, um, so I, some people know, um, but how much they care um, sort of leaves to be seen. But he was also a member of the family club, and in the family club, my sense, and they were, my, their headquarters, well, it's, there's one right downtown, but their club, but they also have a ranch out in those, in that area. My sense was that they were maybe a little bit more liberal offshoot of the Bohemian Club. I'm not totally sure that's true, um, but it, it's in that same, same sort of neighborhood. So, yeah, I think there's some people that realize it, um, but again, I, um, there isn't anything obvious that really, you know, marks that as a place that he owned a ranch and, and stuff. So, yeah. Hi. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, I, have, I have two questions. Okay. One is, um, didn't he have two sons and was the second son involved? And then my other question is his, the reason why he was only J.O. Joe. Oh, okay. Um, he had two children. A boy and a girl. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Joe Jr. Um, was two years older than his daughter, Patty. Um, and they were, the, the funny thing about that is that Joe, 
the Bolognas that uh, the Bologna I showed you as an example. Joe was meticulous, and whenever he would do something for one child, he would do something for the other as well. Mm -hmm. So they always were treated very, very fairly and evenly. Um, Joey hated his sister's artwork. He could care less about it. All he cared about, and he loved, was the artwork that Joe had done for his son Joey. And he treasured that to the point where Joey sold most, Joey's sister Patty died many years before Joey did. And Joey sold all of Patty's stuff. I mean, he didn't even want it. Um, <laughs> which fortunately was sold to a good person who really loves Joe Moore and has kept it. So, but, um, and he changed his name um, from J.J. Mora to Joe Mora right after his father passed away, which was in about 1910, I think. And it was kind of symbolic for him of a new direction. It was, his dad's dying was a real moment in his life where he had an epiphany that he loved and wanted to follow the path of the sculptor. And even though he did all these other things, you know, from that time through the end of his life, he finally sort of saw himself as a sculptor in the style of his father or in the spirit of his father. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time that he some sort of symbolically said, okay, I'm going to change it to J.O. Mora instead of J.J. Mora. Um, and that's the way he signed everything from that point on. But not J.O.E. No, you know, it was, ne there were, he never used the E. Yeah. And I don't know if it was too common or, or what, but yeah. Now, having said that, many people have used the E. I have a stack of things that have been printed that say J-O-E, uh -huh. but, but it's always just careless. And, you know, the, Thank you. The, the drawing of the child said Cinco, yeah. which was, yes. was that his yeah. given name? Yes, yes. In fact, yes, it was um, Joseph, Joseph Jacinto Mora was his full name. Oh, okay. Yeah. And when I write it, I write it, the full name, I write Joseph, Jacinto, Joe, and then Mora. Um, just to kind of get the different iterations, but it doesn't have the J.J. Mora. Um, and he used that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, and you have to give me the hook here, but uh, the other thing that happened um, is that when he, there was that moment when he, uh, we talked about that he kept journals and that he was writing letters, um, I didn't mention that so much, but once, his, um, once he was a father, got married and was a father, all of that changed pretty much for him. And, and I think he just put all that energy that he had had as, a, as an individual person into being a family, part of the family. And so he really, he did, he did two more journals and but very, and or actually one more journal after that, and one more set of letters, which was while he was in World War One training. But I really think that was a pivotal time for him uh, getting married and then being a father and having two children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so didn't you say that one of his kids was also named Joe? Yes. So wouldn't it be like Joe Jr.? So his name would also be JJ. Um, yes. It, could have been, yeah, but um, Joey, he, I have to be honest, I never quite knew what to call him, um, and we, I knew him for a long time, but Joey, he went by Joey, and then he also went by Joe Moore, both, or Joe Jr., Joe Jr., so it was, I think both were okay, and I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is, if it should have been Joey, or if it should have been Joe Jr., but he could have signed it. When you when you abbreviate junior, you usually add the R. So it would have been a J and then J R and then Mora for his son. With a little period after the R. So so we signed it in J M J R. So um, he didn't that that adds an extra M in there. So. <coughs> Well, I, there's one more little anecdote. I mean, uh, I want to, first of all, let's give Peter another round of applause.